Han soldiers had three critical missions along the wall. Defend against invasion, gather military intelligence on enemy activity, and keep the vital beacon towers maintained and supplied with beacon fire fuels. Han Dynasty signal towers incorporated several sorts of alarms. Flags and smoke were only used in the daytime. Torches were only used at night. Bigger bonfires and drums were used at any time. And complex codes were devised for these signals. And just like today, modern codes, they were all classified as top secret and unknown to the public. From around 200 BC to 200 AD, just about the time that Rome was dissolving as a republic only to be reborn as an empire that would gobble up and transform the Western world, China was an empire that was consuming and transforming the East. During the Han Dynasty, the population of China grew to 50 million people. The empire went as far south as Vietnam, as far west as Afghanistan. It was massive. But after 400 years, just like Rome, internal disintegration started to overshadow military success, and in 184 AD, a peasant rebellion brought the Han Dynasty to a screeching halt. And once again, China was on the verge of chaos. For three centuries, warfare, treachery, and death were the rule in China. And once again, it took a ruthless hand to put an end to the time of turmoil. In the sixth century, a northern people, the Sui, declared war on the chaos, conquering one part of the empire after another, until China was united again for the first time since the Han Dynasty fell three centuries earlier. The Emperor Yangdi would build the Sui Empire on the foundation of nearly 1,000 years of dynasties that came before. Unlike previous emperors who had concentrated on fortifying China against the outside world, Yangdi would channel his energies inward and strengthen his empire within its borders. China is vast and its waterways provided the most efficient means of transportation over such great distances. Two major rivers traverse the country east to west, the Yangtze in the south and the Yellow River in the north, but they are a thousand miles apart. China was a house divided. Yang Di decided to do something about that. He aimed to link northern and southern China by a gigantic central artery, a grand canal, a kind of hydraulic highway for merchants, soldiers, and citizens. Very common to China uh, in terms of constructing um, any large infrastructure project. You know, they would look at existing waterways and try to find an area where they could connect and link the entire uh, canal. They want to take advantage of natural uh, geography this gigantic construction project would take more than one million man days of work, most of it digging. Living and working conditions were horrendous, harsh and primitive. Tens of thousands died of starvation, fatigue and illness. Many were simply beaten to death by overseers. More than 24 locks were needed to create a massive network of channels. But every time you encounter a natural body of water, you need a lock to make a barrier between the canal and the lake or the river. When you go up any uh, significant grade, you have to have locks to uh, raise the water and the boats with it to get over any uh, rise in the terrain. It took five million workers over six years to build the Grand Canal. When it was built, it stretched 1,200 miles, and it was the longest and most ambitious canal project that had ever been enacted on the Earth up to that time. By connecting the Yellow River with the Yangtze, the Grand Canal could now transport goods up to 45 miles a day. Major cities along the canal grew into silk, porcelain, and cotton centers. Merchants and artisans supplied manufactured goods to opening markets throughout the entire country. 
economically speaking, it made inter-regional trade much easier, as well as providing work for a lot of people, building it, maintaining it, working on it, transporting goods and people up and down it. Like the Nile in Egypt, it integrated the north and the south, strengthening the foundations of a unified empire. Well, the canal was a tremendous generator of wealth. There was opportunity for poets to travel, for painters to uh, wander and uh, begin painting landscapes. So it really was an engine of cultural development, not just along its own route, but uh, with influence far beyond uh, its own confines. With his engineering feat completed, Emperor Yang Di decided it was time for a victory tour down the Grand Canal. It was a garish spectacle, with an entourage of thousands traveling in opulence that bordered on the obscene. Well, the emperor had beautifully appointed luxurious imperial barges that could take him down the Grand Canal. So he would spend as much as half of every year enjoying himself in the sunny south. The emperor redefined luxury demanding exquisite foods and exorbitant tribute from every county and town along the canal. When large amounts of leftover delicacies were dumped overboard, the destitute who built the canal watched from the shore in despair. But once again, a Chinese emperor underestimated the power of the people. His voyages of conspicuous consumption fueled a mounting sense of rage against his decadent regime. In 618 AD, the people rebelled in a series of peasant uprisings throughout the country. Once again, chaos consumed China and soon reached the palace itself. Emperor Yang Di was killed by his own generals and the Sui dynasty came to an abrupt end. But with the empire united again, the stage was now set for China's golden age. And for the first time, China's engineers would extend the empire's reach around the globe. From the 4th century BC on, the Chinese used blast furnaces to cast iron, nearly 1,800 years before its widespread use in Europe. Six centuries ago, an astonishing armada of Chinese ships crossed the China Sea before venturing west to Ceylon, Arabia, and East Africa. It was a fleet unlike any that had ever put to sea. Giant nine-masted junks escorted by dozens of supply ships, patrol boats, and transports for cavalry horses. Crew totaled more than 27,000 sailors and soldiers. This was the famed armada of the powerful Ming Dynasty, a herald to the world that after a century of Mongol domination, China was returned to its rightful rulers. At its helm was an unlikely admiral, a commoner from the outlying Yunnan province, who rose to become one of the most powerful figures of the Ming Dynasty. His name was Zheng Ha. Zheng Ha was 11 when his hometown was conquered by the Ming. He was plucked from his family, brought to court as a gift for the emperor's son, and castrated. Eunuchs appear often in Chinese history.